Hey guys, I got you each. Hey guys, I got Hey guys, I got you each a gift. No way, Jesus, why? Oh, well, I just love you guys, so I wanted to get you something. Oh, wow. that's so nice. Laura, you first. Wow, this is so exciting. Oh, will you look at this, a little eight ounce can of Coke? This is perfect for me. I looked everywhere to find a gift for you, and this just seemed to fit. I love it. Drew? Yeah, your turn. All right. <laughs> No way, Jesus. Seriously? Oh, yeah. 20 ounces of Coke? Yeah, baby. Woo! This is awesome. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much. You're welcome. Laura, we gotta go show Richard our gifts. Come on. Okay. Hey, Laura? Is there a problem? No. I mean, well, yeah, kind of, you know? It's just that every time you give people gifts, you always give everyone else more than you give me. What do you mean? I mean, like, I open my gift and, oh, cute, eight ounces, and then Drew opens his gift and, hello, 20 ounces. Oh, I know what you mean. Well, that gift is for Drew. Well, that's what I want. Uh, go get it for me. Okay, if that's what you want. Yeah. I got a liter! Oh. I know, it's one liter of God's sweet goodness. Jesus gave it to me. He did? Yes. Okay, you know what? You're gonna meet somebody with a bigger bottle and you are gonna be so mad. Laura, check it out! I got an upgrade! Coke 3.0! <laughs> that is awesome! I know! Well, isn't that just great? Yeah! Hey, Jesus, you rock! Yeah. Thanks, what Drew. What is wrong with you? Why are you holding back your best from me? I gave you my best. Don't you see what's happening here? You're letting everyone else's gifts steal your joy. No, Jesus, you are stealing my joy by giving everyone else more than you give me. Laura, I picked this gift out for you. That's what I wanted you to see. I don't care. Until you can look past this, all you're going to see is a can of Coke. We give out the idea to know it that God loves us more than we can ever comprehend. Look beyond the normal things that happen to God's great love in all of its breadth and depth, including even the troubles we have. I was listening to the radio this week and there was a woman who was talking about the grief that she had felt because her two dogs had died. And she loved those dogs wonderfully and then when they died, it really struck her and, and she, for a couple of years, uh, grieved over the dogs and their loss. Um, she talked about the unconditional love of some of the uh, uh, younger people here might have a dog. Anybody? No? No, you're missing out. Um, she talked about the unconditional love that dogs give you and how uh, lovely it was to be loved like that. And it is a lovely thing, isn't it? to have unconditional love uh, from, a, from a pet. Unless, of course, you have a cat, in which case, you know, you've got to give the cat unconditional love. Uh, but we won't go there tonight. Um, I want us to think about uh, the unconditional love that we experience and our need for it. And, and it interests me, um, I think that people actually sometimes look for love with their pets because they don't have anybody else to love which is really sad, but it's a reality in our society which is increasingly more individualistic. Um, and we see it in all kinds of uh, different ways. Um, there is a, a thing going on in, in society at the moment, a trend to know your identity. And your identity is a buzzword. You've got to understand who you are. And there's the search for that. In the old days, your identity used to be defined by the idea of society, uh, your place in society. So you might be a postman, you might be a school student, you might be a lawyer, whatever it is, and that was your identity. It was given to you by society. But now people are saying, identity is self-determined. I can make up whatever I want to be, and I can say that that's what I'm going to be, and society has to agree with that. And I actually think uh, it's partially come about because of a desperate need people have for affirmation, for that love that they want, that uh, recognition that they are important and significant in the world. 
but it's it's a loser's game because uh, if you're insisting that other people actually agree with you on your self-identity, not only is it traumatic for society because society um, has to struggle with sometimes self-contradictory definitions of what people say they are, but it's traumatic for the people who are trying to get their identity in this way because they must have affirmation from society about who they are. And if they don't get that affirmation, well, you know, they're, they're victims. And um, they're, they, they are not able to satisfy that need that they're searching for, uh, for um, love and care. Uh, Mike Wells, um, I put a little article that he wrote in the bulletin this week, if you haven't read it yet. Uh, and, and I think Mike very helpfully unpacks some of these false trails that people in our society run down to get affirmation and fill the void. And if it's not identity, then it, it, it can be things like uh, what you wear, which in fact affects your identity, or what you own, or your work, or people looking for some way to uh, seem important in the eyes of others. And I think Mike's comment is very helpful. The we who love the Lord and know him ought to actually recognize because we're loved uh, as we are, we can run naked. We don't have to put on any airs. We don't have to have a fancy house. We don't have a particular kind of car or particular kind of clothes because God loves us with all our blemishes and faults as we are. And that we as a church can be an example to the rest of society that we are secure in ourselves because the living God of the universe cares about me, sinner that I am, naked as I might be before him and we are unencumbered by the image factory of society that insists that we have to be this kind of way to be important in people's eyes. Free to be ourselves, all faults and blemishes accepted. Beautiful picture. Naked before people, naked before one another, naked before God. It reminded me when I read it of um, my minister many years ago who was a very passionate preacher. And he took up this topic one night, and uh, in church he was talking about how we bring nothing to God. We, we can't, you know, our fancy houses, our wealth, our intelligence, whatever it is, we bring nothing to God. And he, he took his clerical collar, just pulled it off and said, do you think this impresses God? I'm naked before God. I'm, I'm not important because I'm a clergyman, in fact. And he took, then he took his shirt off. So he's there in his trousers and his T-shirt, and he's saying, being a minister is not important before God. What's important is that I'm saved by grace. I'm naked before God. And he waxed eloquent about this and went on and on. And then when he undid his belt, we all went, oh no, please. <laughs> we get the point, okay? We understand that we can't bring anything to God. Does it make you feel uncomfortable, the idea that you might be naked before the God of the universe? I think it does because we know our faults and we know our blemishes. We know our inadequacies and we feel inadequate. And so that's why we are so desperate for affirmation, I think. Somewhere, super people might see us as important enough to love us and care for us. And when we don't get that, we are anxious and depressed and we pursue a never-ending treadmill of trying to get meeting somewhere, whether it's in gender identity or, or what we have or, or whatever. And the irony is the solution is before us as Christian people, we belong to God. And that's all that matters. God cares about us, even with all of our faults. He looks on our nakedness and he says, come all who labour and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Or to use Jesus' term, you know, he, he takes, takes the... Um, uh, God says, oh, how I would have loved to have gathered you, gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks and with her wings cover your nakedness. God cares uh, for us as we are and looks beyond our faults. So that's, that's a wonderful love. And I think it's epitomised in the story of the prodigal son. Remember, he really stuffed up. 
and uh, I, I don't know if you remember the full story, but he decided in the end, after spending all his dad's money and in wild living and wasting it all, he realised that he was going to starve and that he had to go back and apologise to his dad. And I think he underestimated his father because he came back saying, treat me like one of your hired servants. And the father immediately says, put the ring on his finger, put the best cloth at both clothes on him, let's have a, a, a feast. And not only did that son underestimate the love of the father, but the older son too, if you remember the story, underestimated the love of the father. And the older son said, you never gave me a party, and blamed the father for showing love. But it is unbelievable love that the father, having lost all of his hard work over many years, now loves this son who's come back into his life. And Jesus gave us that picture to know that we too can be welcomed back to our Heavenly Father. So uh, my, my proposal tonight is that we do not fully comprehend the love God has for us. And I want you to think about what that, uh, that love is for you and how you might be able to see a little bit more of it. I want to talk about four things very quickly as to why we don't comprehend that love and then four things as to what will happen if we do see a little bit of God's love for us. So that's where we're going. But first of all, a definition of love. Now this definition comes from Bobby, who is aged seven. Okay, so some of the young people might relate to this. This is Bobby's definition of love. Love is when at Christmas time you stop unwrapping presents and listen. That's love. And I want us tonight to stop for all the other things that are bothering us and all the rest of it and listen to what God has to say about his love for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can think about these things tonight, this wonderful truth that you have gone to so much trouble to reveal to us down through the centuries. Help us to understand the import of it for our life personally, this night, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Now I think the love of a parent is a great place to start when we're thinking about God's love for us. My father was not a perfect man in any sense of the words, but I know he did love me. And I remember on, his, on my 13th birthday, he said to me, because you're turning 13, Ray, I want to give you a record player. Now this was back last century in the olden days, <laughs> when, uh, you know, in the late 60s, when music was the thing. And so I was very excited about a record player, that's great. And we went to the record shop um, and I got a brainwave at the shop. I said, Dad, let's not get a record player. If we get a tape recorder, now, for the young people here, I've got to explain what a tape recorder is. <laughs> Do you know what a tape recorder is? And yeah, okay, you did, okay, that, that's good. Yeah. It was an old fashioned way of doing things, not like an MP3 player or something like that. It, it had real tapes on it and all the rest of it. And I said, you can get one of those and you can listen to, and record stuff off the radio and then we'll get the music for free and we'll have lots of songs. We don't have to have a record player and buy records. Well, he wasn't so keen on that idea. And I talked to him about it for a while and tried to convince him and he said, no, I think we need a record player. And so we bought it. Here it is. Still fresh from the 60s, right there. I'm going to show it to you tonight. Still works. The gift from my dad. Now, I discovered why he was keen that I had a record player and not a tape recorder. You see, he had records as well. So he wanted to play his records on my record player. Ben, would you have let your dad play on your record player? <laughs> well, I didn't mind at all. I didn't care that my dad wanted to play his records. Of course, you know, money was really tight for us back then. He worked three jobs and he could have bought that record player for himself. But he didn't. He wanted to share it with me. And so I was very happy to share it with him and it was just a wonderful remembrance of my dad that he did love me uh, like that. Now, I, don't, I, th I think I understood a little bit of the sacrifice he made because of his love for me. But I think uh, that as a child, even as a teenager, even as an adult, I don't really fully comprehend all the sacrifices my parents made for me when I was growing up. And only when I became a dad, I began to see a little bit of what it cost to be a parent. 
and you'll learn it one day when you guys grow up. But in the meantime, we don't comprehend fully. And I want to suggest to you that just like we don't comprehend what our earthly parents do for us, we do not have any idea really of what our Heavenly Father has done for us. And I want us to think that through. John Owen, the great Puritan preacher, said, The greatest sorrow and burden we can lay on the Father, the greatest unkindness we can do to Him, is to think that He doesn't love us. When He does love us. So, first reason we have trouble comprehending love, God's love for us is that we have trouble understanding and comprehending big things. A.W. Tozer says that the uh, love of God is a boundless ocean. How big is that? An ocean without shore. How do you get your head around that? How do you get your head around the normal ocean that there is around the place? Well, um, Psalm 147 talks about how God names the stars and binds our wounds. This is the power of the God we serve. He, he, the, the supernovas happen, and then he also, after dealing with the supernovas, binds our wounds, such as his tenderness and love for us. This is an amazing a being, an amazing God. We get a definition of, joy, of love uh, in 1 John, where we're told that God is love. Such is the way that he provides for us. So think about the way that God has provided for you, okay? First of all, you were born. Thank you, I've got life. I get to live uh, and enjoy all the things I do each day, each birthday. I see beautiful things in the world all the time. I'm able to enjoy that. That's a blessing of God. Uh, if someone has told me about Jesus, then that's a blessing. If I've responded to the blessing about Jesus, then that's a gift of God as well, him working in my life. And he gives you his Holy Spirit to guide and direct you. He gives you his commandments so that you might be able to serve him and obey him in, in, in your life. The blessings of God keep coming on and on. Uh, God's word is there. Uh, tonight, the blessing, you might think, oh, I'm just at church. This is a great blessing of God. There are some countries where you can't do it. Um, here we are free to do it. And you've actually come. And you're able to encourage others and people are here to encourage you. That's a gift of God. And what a wonderful gift. Such beautiful people to be amongst tonight. How good is that? And that's to say nothing of Jesus dying on the cross for us. And all the sacrifice that he did in that regard, enduring hell, so that we might live forever with God. It's an incredible thing, God's love for us. When I was preparing this sermon, and reminded me of the great truth. You can do nothing to make God love you more. And you can do nothing to make God love you less. He loves you with all his heart. You are, as I said last week, his special possession. His precious possession. Your name is written on his hand, as it were. Because you belong to him. Max Licardo says an interesting thing. It's interesting that an almighty God puts his love on sinful beings like us, even when we turn our back on him. And he still seeks us. And the Bible is full of stories of people who keep turning their back on God and God pursues them. The book of Hosea is an incredible example of that. And uh, talking about Song of Solomon, Max Licardo says these words, It may seem strange to think about God intoxicated with love for us, but how else do you explain his actions? Did logic put God in the manger? Did common sense nail him to a cross? No, God came as a prince with his eye on a maiden, willing to slay the dragon, if that's what it took, so that he might have a relationship with us. And that's what it took, as Jesus died on the cross to destroy Satan. One of my favourite verses is 1 John 3 verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has for us that we should be called children of God. And you could translate that, from what country is this love? So foreign is this kind of love. So different to the, the, the loves that we often experience that aren't unconditional. Loves that maybe have conditions to them and are imperfect. The writer, 1 John says, what kind of love is this? So foreign is it that the God of the universe loves sinners like you and me. 
that we could be called children of God. Do you, and, and we reflected much on what that means. That we are heirs, inheritors of all that God owns. The young people here, you know, uh, you won't bring it up, but one day your parents yeah. might bring up the fact, well, there's going to be an inheritance for you guys, and you might, you know, receive a bit of money or something as, as something because you belong to a particular family. We belong to the family of God if we're Christian, and we inherit the earth and the universe. Everything that the God owns is ours. From what country is that kind of love from? God loves us that much and even more. Um, God gives us our troubles. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, not so sure about that. It's the second reason why we have trouble believing that God loves us, because God gives us troubles. But he gives us troubles for a purpose. He never promises us an easy life. And we read in Acts chapter 9 that the Lord said to Ananias, talking about the Apostle Paul, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles. I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Paul's gig is to suffer in his life for Jesus. That's what he's called to. And that is a blessing, believe it or not, brothers and sisters. And Paul worked it out. And so that's why uh, Paul, in the end, when he had a thorn in the flesh, for example, he said that God spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. And he discovered that, okay, sometimes life is hard because God wants to work a grace in our lives. Well, more about that when we get to our passage, which is going to come very soon. Let me two other things very quickly. Why we have trouble believing uh, in the love of God. Uh, thirdly, we think we're unworthy. Well, guess what? We're absolutely right. We aren't worthy of God's love for us. We don't deserve it. And yet, God loves us. Jesus loved to hang out with the tax collectors and the sinners and welcome them in. And there's nothing we could have ever done that has keeps us away from the love of God, no matter how black our past is. Fourthly, we don't know how to respond to God's love. That's why we have trouble with it. Remember the story of Peter in the Last Supper? And Peter, uh, Jesus is going around washing people's feet, and Jesus gets to Peter's feet and says, no way, <laughs> you're not going to wash my feet. That's the lowliest of the low. I know that you're the Lord. You don't do that. I'm supposed to do that for you. And Jesus says, Peter, I need to do it. Because you need to learn that this is what it's about. God is here and he serves you and loves you and will sacrifice for you. And if Peter had trouble kind of getting his head around it, Paul is blown away by the whole uh, idea of God's love for him. He talks about how God's love compels him and drives him. He, when he talks about God's love in Romans 8, he says a very interesting thing. He says, God loved us. He doesn't say God is loving us. Present tense. He says past tense. God loved us. In Paul's mind, as he thinks about God's love, it's the death of Jesus on the cross that is foremost before him. And for Paul... Uh, it compels him, uh, like you know, water going between two rocks is forced forward. And so when Paul sees that he is loved, past tense, then he has to love. The love of Christ compels us to love others. Okay, well, what happens when we do actually comprehend something of the love of God, even though we might struggle to get our head around it? Well, number one, we turn now to our passage. You'll be very glad to know. Very quickly, we're going to work our way through it. Verses 3 and 4, if we comprehend God's love for us, we're going to appreciate every blessing that we're given. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, uh, the God of all compassion, who comforts us in our troubles. Paul appreciates God's provision, even in the trouble. He doesn't blame God. He just knows that God is there with him in it. What a comfort that is. And we will appreciate it if we understand that that suffering there is part of God's gift uh, to us. Good comes, we're grateful for it, sure. Bad comes, 
Well, we should be grateful for it because God is going to do a work in our life and we need it so that we might actually be the people God has designed us to be. There may be a question in there afterwards. I was, I was preparing this talk uh, a while ago and I was in the bathroom and I just turned the tap on. Water came out. Turned the tap off. Stopped. Turned the tap on again. Water. Turned it off. And I just stood there and marveled. I can get not just water, but clean water. I can get warm water out of the tap. The gift of God. Something that I just, you would always take for granted. And yet I'm, what, what, 10% of the world that has a tap in my house? And, uh, and so it just reminded me of the, the need to appreciate all that God has given me, from the simple things to the big things, like the suffering that comes, because God wants to do a work in me. And to see that and to trust God in the midst of it. So how do you do that? How do you try and appreciate what God has done for you. I, I don't think we can fully appreciate it. Uh, A.W. Tozer talks about a child looking at a star. You know, when a young child looks at a star, I don't know, Ben, when you look at a star, whether you understand that there are nuclear reactions going on. Is that right? You know about that? That's great, you know that. And that's millions and millions of kilometers away. Now, we understand a little bit about that, um, but, you know, we don't know it all. All we can do is point out and say, isn't that wonderful? Isn't it beautiful? The stars are there for me to enjoy. A gift of God. God loves me and cares for me. And, uh, and I think that whatever happens in our life, to be able to say, God's at work. Thank him for that. So that's the second thing. First thing, if we comprehend something of God's love for us, we'll appreciate all that God does for us. Um, secondly, uh, we will love because we are loved. Verse 4, Paul shares his comfort with others because he knows the comfort that God has given him. And so if we understand a little bit of God's love, then we will share our riches. I was uh, ministering down in Chatswood um, years ago and there was a hobo, a drug addict, who used to live in the porch of the church. And uh, he was just very difficult to get on with, especially when he was high on drugs and he used to urinate all around the place and we always had to be cleaning up, all the rest of it. And one, one Friday I came uh, there because youth group was about to happen and there was a real mess in the porch again and I thought, oh, Billy's been back here again, oh no, I'm going to have to sort this out. And uh, then I saw Billy sitting in the gutter with one of the youth group girls and she was just loving him and talking to him and caring for him. And I was just rebuked because, you know, I was being the minister. You know, I the work of God to do. I, I don't need to. And, and she's the one doing the work of God. Loving this guy who desperately needed love. And out of her riches, she was able to share to people who sometimes can be a great pain. And yet, we're called to love them anyway. 2 Peter 1.9 is a very interesting verse. It talks about how if we're not living the Christian life, we have forgotten that uh, the one who has died for us. Now you think, well, hang on a minute. I don't forget that Jesus dies for me. But Jonathan Edwards points out what Peter is saying is that while we might know in our hearts that Jesus loves us, sorry, no, in our heads that Jesus loves us, we don't know in our hearts. We've forgotten, we've not allowed it to touch our affections. And if it touches our affections, out of our riches, we will love others as we ought. Second thing we'll do if we understand God's love is third thing, verse 9, we will be humble. Paul, in his extremity, doesn't try and solve his problems. He says, this has happened so that I might not rely on myself, but on God who actually raises the dead. Fourthly and finally, a fourth thing, if we understand God's love for us. Not only will we appreciate every blessing, not only will we love because we are loved, not only will we be humble and sit under what God is doing in our life, but we will trust God, whatever happens to us. I remember um, a lovely lady um, that uh, I was ministering to who was going to a nursing home. 
And at that time, I was having some trouble with my neighbours about uh, our house. And our neighbours were making life very difficult for us and writing to the Archbishop and, and local members, and it was just a nightmare, and I won't go into the details on it. And I was just stressed by the whole thing. And I went to this nursing home to visit this lady. She'd just come into the nursing home, and she'd been put in a corridor. And that's where she was going to stay. And by that I mean that it was just a little bit wider than this hall, uh, uh, walkway here. It wasn't as long as that, but at the end of it there was a window and a bed and a curtain across the bed. And there was another lady sleeping in that bed. She had a bed on this side of the corridor and she had a dresser on that side of the corridor and then the door. And that was her room. And she said to me, Ray, I'm just so grateful for a roof over my head and these people who are caring for me now, God has really blessed me. I know I've, I've come here and this is where I'm going to die, but I know that God's looking after me. And oh, I just was blown away. I thought to myself, my troubles, I've got a whole house and, and all these wonderful blessings of God and I'm not appreciating them. And here she is with nothing in a corridor, grateful to God for the goodness that is happening to her. And she's trusting God as she's headed towards her death. And... Uh, and that's what happens when you understand that God loves you. But whatever circumstance you're in, as humble as it might be, God's going to bless you with it. And what a joy to walk that road, is it not? Whether you've got eight ounces of Coke or whether you've got three litres of Coke, God gives you what he thinks is best for you. And so you rejoice in that. And you don't compare yourself with others. You can be naked. That's all right. And you can accept what God has done for you and love him for it. So little Bobby, age seven, understood that love had to be experienced. Can I encourage you this week, as you turn on your taps, as you experience God's love in whatever way, whatever forms, even in the troubles that come, to know that God has his hand on your life and he loves you more than you will ever know. And he will watch over you until he takes you to be with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you love us more than we'll ever comprehend. Please help us to love you back. May Christ so dwell in our hearts through faith that being rooted and grounded in love, we may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, our inheritance. Amen. Our next hymn is a hymn that's uh, very appropriate in the light of... Oh, I've got a question first. Oh, Ian! Yes. Excellent! Yes. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> well, I just got so carried away. Well, we certainly have time for a good question. Uh, do you have a question or are you just suggesting? Oh, I will, but uh, I thought you made very clear at the start that you're going to have questions. Yes, thank sure. you. Questions. Who would like to start with the question? Or a comment? That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, comment. Yeah, I'd like to start with a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I can answer this one. Yeah. Uh, it's actually about the Christian life. Yeah. Solved all of those problems? Uh, well, I don't have questions slash comment anyway, so you can just thanks, better bother putting up. Mm -hmm. So, Paul's talking about how if we've experienced comfort, we can comfort others. Yes. Um, but that's really hard because I haven't necessarily experienced the same comfort that other people might need in their situation. Okay. Yep. So, for example, I haven't experienced comfort which comes from having breast cancer because I haven't had that, which I'm sure it has. Yep. So how do I share the comfort I've received with someone else in a, in a different situation? Okay. So that's one, that's the question. Yep. But I'll be, I reckon you need to add an extra application point for what you do when you know you're loved, and that's, you got to pray. Yeah, yeah. When I was a youth group, one of the youth group leaders said, you can't see love someone you don't pray for them. And okay. Paul makes it pretty clear in here that one, I'm answering my own question in some ways. <laughs> one way to come to people is by praying for them. Yep. And he actually expresses that as well. So yep. can you comment on the first question and yes. then maybe the place of prayer yep. in loving Okay, thank you very much. I, well, let me do it back to front. Um, uh, the, the, the praying side of thing is absolutely right, and I think 
Uh, yes, thank you for that. that. That is a lack of what I've said. And uh, we will respond in prayer that uh, automatically as we understand something. When you know that you are loved, you, you can't help but speak back. So I think that's very true. And I think probably there'd be seven, eight, you know, nine, and 10, 11, 12 different other things that we might respond to in that regard uh, as love happens. And let, let that happen, you know, in your life. As, as God convicts you of uh, the way he loves you, respond um, with all your being to that. Um, to your first point about how do you comfort people um, who are going through different circumstances to yours, great question. I think you've got to look at the issues of principle behind where you find the comfort. So if you're, let's just say for example, uh, you are struggling because you've lost a, a, a loved one that, that in your family. And so that's your grief, uh, but you have found that there's a peace in the fact that you know that, that loved one has gone to be with the Lord. And so there is a comfort there that even though there is a, a temporary parting, that ultimately you will be with the Lord in heaven. So there's a basic principle that um, comforts you that is beyond the situation of your grief, and that is the basic principle that I'm going to be in heaven one day um, with those I love. And so I think to put that basic principle into practice when you might be talking to Michelle or, or someone else in some other circumstance, to be able to say, one of the things that's really helped me in my life is the surety that I am going to live forever with God in heaven. And that is a hope that we can all have, whether you're sick or, or whether you're you know, going through financial troubles or whatever like that. And so that is the basis of the comfort. And I think that's part of the reason why we go to church and why we learn what we learn and, and become theologians, as it were, so that we can know those basic principles that undergird our life so that um, we can apply them to the different circumstances that come our way. But great question, thank you. Anybody want to come back at me on that or make another comment or question? It's getting warm in here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been our being that the preacher was. <laughs> I'll start undressing you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> um, oh, let's stand here. Thank you.